Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to start our exploration of a few of the features of Houdini 11. And we're going to start off with the new shader model or material model. <clears throat> and I'm going to demonstrate this by producing shaders for this model here of a lamp. And if we go into the material palette, uh, one of the first things we notice is that there are far fewer materials here than there were in Houdini 10. So what's happened? Well, the answer is that this material here, which I'll just drag and drop into our shop context here, the Mantra Surface node is a kind of all-purpose shader which is designed to replace most of the shaders, individual shaders that used to be here. So let's have a look at how we can use it. I'm going to start off by constructing a wood texture to go on this floor area here. So let's call this, let's rename this wood. And let's uh, use a texture to give this some coloration. And this allows us to have a look at these tabs here in the properties panel. So let me maximize this. And we can see that we have two, or three rather, main tabs here at the top. There's the Surface tab, and that, broadly speaking, is used to set the color and transparency and so on of the surface. There's a Displacement tab, which allows you to add displacements or bump maps to the surface. And then there's an OpenGL tab, which allows you to set how the object will be displayed in the 3D view using OpenGL shaders. We're not going to cover the OpenGL tab today. Let me start by having a look at the Surface tab. Uh, and there are a number of sub-tabs here, each of which controls some aspect of the shading of the surface. The one that you're going to use most often is this first one here, Diffuse, which sets up the diffuse lighting, in other words, the basic color of the surface. And there are two ways to control how that surface interacts with light. There's a basic diffuse intensity, and then there's a roughness. Increasing this roughness gives you a clay-like effect uh, using a lighting model called the Oren Naya model. And as you can see, we can set the base color of our object. We can have that affected by any color information that we've added to the points of that object. And we can also use a color map. So let me select that. And I have actually prepared a map earlier. Here we are, which is uh, a texture map of a wood grain texture. So in fact, I already had this applied to the base. So it immediately comes up with that texture. And if we have a look in the render view, and pick our camera, we should see it starting to render, there we are, with our wood texture in place. So that's how to use the Mantra shader at its most basic level. Well, let's see what I can do about the fact that this is reflecting a black sky. A new feature in Houdini 11 is uh, well, a new, not a new feature, but a new implementation, is the environment light. Uh, environment lights existed in Houdini 10, but they've been adapted a little bit in Houdini 11. So I've laid down an environment light, and I'm going to give it an environment map here. And I've got a, a sky map of some kind that I've, I've created. Uh, and... There's a new parameter here, which is rendering mode. And we can see that it either provides direct lighting, ambient occlusion, or here, ray tracing background. That's what I'm going to select, ray tracing background. And what that means is that when a ray hits uh, nothing as it goes out, it's given the color of the environment at that point. So if I have a look at my render view, 
uh, we can see everything's gone rather dark. And the reason for that is that now I've got a light in the scene. Uh, the render is not automatically adding a headlight. So I'm going to need temporarily at least to provide uh, another bit of lighting. So I'm going to create a distant light. And then let's have another look at the render view. Uh, and we can see, perhaps not very well, that this is now creating a nice reflection here. Let's zoom in on that. And have another look at the render. And we can see that it does now look much more like some chrome. take things one step further, I'm going to add a bump map to this wood texture. So I'm going to go onto the Displacement tab. I'm going to switch off True Displacements. And I'm going to enable a Displacement Map. And I'm going to choose Formica Bump. And we can see that this is now producing a much more bumpy texture. The amount of bumpiness is controlled by this factor here. So I'm going to take that down. 2.01. It just gives us a little bit of bumpiness. Uh, now you notice that there's a displace direction option here. The default here is that you have an image where a mid-tone of grey is no displacement, darker values are a negative displacement, and lighter values are a positive displacement. Now in fact in the texture I've got I want to have everything uh, have down is white. So the non-displaced areas are going to be white. The True Displacements tab here, the True Displacements box, chooses between bump mapping, where only the normal of the surface is changed by the displacement map, and True Displacement, when the actual geometry of the surface is changed by the displacement map. So the next thing I'm going to do is add a marble material to this bottom part of the lamp. And instead of using the marble material which is here, I'm going to use another mantra surface shader. And I'm going to do that because I want to demonstrate a little bit more about the internals of these new shaders in Houdini 11. So I've laid one of those down. Let's call it marble. And let's switch to a shop view and maximize. So this is our marble material. And if I double click, we can see immediately a change from Houdini 10. In Houdini 10, if I double click a material, I got a sort of intermediate level uh, where you could see the, diff the color, the displacement, the property aspects of that material all connected together. And then if you dived into any one of those, you got into a VOP network. In Houdini 11, we get straight from the material here into a VOP network. And Houdini 11 is able to do this because there's a new node available in VOPs called the Output Collect. And this is a very special node because what it does is it combines the various components that are coming in here into a single material. So ordinarily, you would have, as there is in this example, a properties VOB connected in. And in this case, that's setting the level of the displacement bound. You would have a surface output node. And this is exactly the same as the output node that used to exist for a surface shader in Houdini 10. So it's got the surface color, the surface opacity, the alpha, the normal, and so on. And that's connected into one of these inputs. And then finally, if we look down here, right at the bottom, we'll find there's a displacement output here, which uh, gives the surface displacement and the surface normal. And that's also connected in. So the new model in Houdini 11 allows you to build the displacement and the surface and the properties parts of your 
material in a single VOP network and that can be much more efficient if you're reusing parts of your network for each of those components. Well perhaps we should say a little bit about what VOPs are. VOP stands for Visual Operator and it's a way of writing a small computer program in Houdini using these visual nodes. And in this case the small program we're writing is a shader it's going to be used by Mantra to determine the color and displacement and so on of objects that Mantra is rendering. Let's have a look at these nodes and we can see that uh, there are a number of new features, one of which is that there's a new node here called Surface Model which is an incredibly comprehensive way of describing shading and allows you to have a more or less ready-made shader which you can adjust with the minimum of effort to produce what you need. Every one of the VOP nodes now has these three tabs at the top. Uh, the first one allows you to debug the node. I'm not going to go into that now. The second allows you to bypass it so that it has no effect. And the third determines how many of these connectors that you actually see. So if I click this once, I'm going to select the node first for reasons we'll, which will become a apparent in a moment. If I click this, then the node apparently disappears. I'm going to push space G to focus on the selected node. And we can see that it is actually still here, but what's happened is it's got a hell of a lot smaller. All of those inputs are now coming into a single input, and all of the outputs come from a single output. So I can click this again, and we don't get back to what we had before. We just get those input connectors which actually have connections, like so. And if I click it a third time, we get back to what we had. You may also notice uh, that on the left-hand side here, there are these strange nodules. And what these indicate is that there are actually some nodes connected into this input, but that they've been hidden. So let's, for example, have a look at the uh, diffuse minimum input here. And if I double-click on this, then it's expanded back out. And if I have a look here, eventually I can see uh, this node here and this is a parameter node uh, all this is doing is allowing the user to set the value of this parameter at the level of the material in other words in the property editor for the material rather than having to dive down to the VOP network so that's connected in here and if I want to hide it again then I need to go on to this connector I need to middle click and I need to hide input nodes and we get back to the little nodule. So let's have a look at another way of managing which connectors are displayed here. I can take a connector, let's do it here for the Fresnel connector, and I can hide it completely. Uh, I can do this by middle clicking on the node and then using Collapse Input Connector. And we can see that that's now disappeared from our list. It is, however, still available to be connected to because right at the bottom here, go right to the bottom, we can see we've got this connector labeled More. If I right-click on that, left-click on that, rather, we can see we get a list of all of the connectors that have not been displayed here. And I can just click on Fresnel, or Fresnel. And I think there's a, a bug here in the code at the moment, because as you can see, we're getting a connector here, uh, which is not actually connecting through to Fresnel. But if I collapse this and open it up again, we can see that we have the Fresnel connector back again. So you can actually remove and replace connectors from the list that displayed. And if we want to connect something to one of the connectors that isn't displayed, you can do that by connecting directly into the more here and selecting the appropriate connector. 
But anyway, what we want to do is to change the diffuse color of our shader to reflect a marble pattern. So let's press ahead with creating our veins pattern. And I'm going to create the nodes for this. So fortunately, there is a pattern that comes with Houdini, which is useful for marble, which is called veins. So I'll lay down a veins node. And it works based on the position. So I'm going to need a global variables node. And I'm going to hit P to bring up the parameter editor for that. And I'm going to output a single variable surface position, P. And then I'm going to feed that into the position here. Now, I want to be able to edit these parameters here, which are going to determine how my marble is going to look. I can, I can do that here in the VOP network. I just select the node, and as you can see, the parameter editor brings up the values of all of these parameters. But what I probably want to do is make them available to the user as part of the parameter interface for the material itself. And there are a number of ways that I can do that. One of which is that I can click on each of these individual nodes, and I can select this is I'm middle clicking here to get the middle click menu. And then I can select promote parameter. And what that's done is create a parameter node. Let me expand it and we can see it. It's created a parameter node which has the right label and so on, which will enable this parameter to be edited at the material level. Let's collapse that back down again. I can also create parameters for all of these inputs. I can do that using uh, by right-clicking on the top of the node here and selecting Create Input Parameters. And we can see we've now got parameters for each of these. In fact, I don't need a couple of these, so I could uh, right-click here on the, the module itself and select Delete Inputs like so. That's got rid of those. So the output of the veins node, and we can hover over it here and we'll see, is a float. And what we want is a color. So we're going to have to use a color mix node to use the output of this as a bias to mix between two colors. And let me demonstrate an alternative way to create uh, parameters or other connectors here, and which is to use the parameter editor. A new in Houdini 11 is this symbol here at the end, and if I left click this, it's it's quite hard to see here because we're uh, we're going off the edge of the recording. We get exactly the same menu that we would get if we middle click on the connector, so we get exactly that menu. So I can, for example, by left-clicking here, promote this parameter and promote this parameter. And we can see that they're both promoted. Now, if I want to edit uh, the parameter that's being created, the parameter node that's been created, for example, to change the default colors, I can either expose this node by left middle-clicking and doing expose input nodes, or I can just jump to the input node, and that selects this here and gives us the parameters for the hidden parameter node. So I want to change the default color and the name. I think this is going to be the marble color, like so. And then at the bottom, I'm going to make this a light uh, but rather desaturated blue color and then I can just click on the node the nodule here and I get the parameter automatically for the next one and I'm going to give that a slightly desaturated dark blue color 
and I'm going to call it rain color. And then I can connect the output of this through and connect it in to the diffuse color here. I can also hide that entire network and I can do that by middle clicking on here and at the bottom uh, you can't see it because it's not on the video there's a hide input nodes let's try doing it up here so we can hide input nodes and now because that's a complex network that's been hidden as opposed to just a parameter node we get this straight connector like so now there's a bug in Houdini 11 at the moment which is causing my system to crash during the next step so I'm going to just save my work and then I'm going to go up to the level above and we can see our parameter editor does have those parameters that we just promoted they're here at the bottom uh, that's not very convenient having them here at the bottom we probably want them to be in a separate tab uh, perhaps at the end here let me take this down and collapse this back down well we've got our marble material here now and we've got our parameters here and we can see that right at the bottom here we've got all of those parameters from the main node that we just created and it would be nice if these weren't just here at the bottom but were perhaps in an extra tab here so that we knew where to find them in Houdini 10 what you would do to achieve that would be to work on the output nodes in the in the bot network that's no longer the workflow in Houdini 11 in Houdini 11 you simply take the parameters here in the parameter editor and here on the gear menu I'm going to left click this and select edit parameter interface can't see the whole of this window but you can see most of it uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is drag and drop left click drag and drop a new folder onto the surface folder here so we get the subfolder of the surface folder and I'm going to call that marble and if we go down the bottom here we can see that we've got all of our vein parameters so I'm going to click the first one and then shift click the last one select all of those and whoops see whether we can grab all of these together something going wrong here today there we go right grab them all together and drag them up and put them into the marble folder here now the next step is to hit accept you can't see the key here but there's an accept button at the bottom uh, at the moment that's causing Houdini 11 to crash so we may find that this crashes the system let's just try that uh, and if it crashes I'm going to pause the video and then recover the scene and we should see that it seems to work this time right um, what we should see if we expand this out is that we now have a marble tab and that has all of the parameters that we had earlier so let's apply this to the base of our lamp that's done and if we have a look at the render view what we should do we can select the right camera what we should see as this renders through is that we're going to get a marble like texture on the base of our lamp. Well, let's have a closer look at how this marble is rendering. So, uh, if I can zoom in, and I've in fact already done that here on the in the scene view, and we're in have a look here. We've got this strange shading on our blocks here, and let's have a look and see whether that's replicated in the render view now. A new feature of Houdini 10 is that you aren't just restricted here in the render view to rendering through the camera. Uh, you can also render through the scene view. So select the scene view. 
we can see we have this odd shading here. And the reason for that is that we're using uh, the smoothed shading effect. And so this is assuming that these flat polygons are actually curved. And there are two ways that I can address this, one of which would be to facet this surface, and that workflow is the same as, as it was in Houdini 10, and there's a video that I did on polygons which explains that. The other thing we can do, and here is the object, is change the way this is rendered, and I'm going to render it as a subdivision surface, and I can do that by selecting polygons as subdivision surface here. And we can see that now that looks much more realistic. Well, the next uh, thing to do is to perhaps put some chrome on this part of the lamp. So let's create some chrome. And I'm going to, again, use the Mantra Surface Builder shader rather than using the ones down here, just to demonstrate how you would go about setting up a chrome material. So the first thing about a chrome material, or indeed any reflective material, is that it tends to have a very low diffuse intensity. It also tends to have pretty dark basic color. So let's set that down to something quite low. Now, you may be wondering where on these tabs here you set up your specular reflections, specular highlights. Well, the new surface model uses the reflection tab to govern both the reflection of lights, in other words, specular highlights, and the reflection of objects. So in fact, it's here under the Reflect, Reflect Lights tab that you find the normal specular settings. And I'm going to reduce the specular intensity down a little bit to 0.8. And the specular color uh, we need to set to something other than white. In general, metals uh, specular highlights on metals are the same color as the metal, uh, whereas on plastics they tend to be white. So on uh, the metal, I'm going to just reduce this down and make it a bit of a gray color. So by default, uh, all this will do is reflect some uh, reflect the lighting, produce specular highlights. And one other thing I want to do is actually change this specular angle. The specular angle determines how blurry the reflection of the lights is. In other words, how big your specular highlights are. So I'm going to reduce this down to something quite small. Something like 2. And this will take care of the specular highlights, but what happens if I want my chrome to reflect other objects in the scene? Well, I need to go to the Reflect Objects tab, and I need to select Reflect Objects. And by default, the settings for the reflection, in other words, how blurry they are, what color they're mixed with, and how intense they are, are derived from the same settings that you've got here on the Reflect Lights tab. And that's physically correct. Uh, in the real world, the reflection of the lights and the reflection of other objects in the scene would be derived from the same basic parameters. So that should be enough to set up a simple chrome material. So uh, let's drag and drop it. Now you can drag and drop materials in the render view as well as in the scene view. So I should be able to let's actually uh, rename this chrome. Left click and drag it across and put it onto this part of the object. See whether this is going to work. Yes, it has. And we can see that it looks quite like chrome around here. That looks quite chrome-like. We're getting some artifacts here. And I suspect that's the same reason that we earlier had artifacts, which is that our base here is probably not being rendered as a subdivision surface. So let's select that, and that should sort out those artifacts. As you can see, that now looks very much like some chrome. This blackness on the top here is because, of course, the, the sky in our scene is black. 